Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alex Trembath. I am a senior analyst at the Breakthrough Institute. We're a environmental think tank in, uh, I don't always get uh, applause for that one. Um, <laughs> Thank you, it's strongly appreciated. Uh, we're an, for those who don't know, we're an environmental think tank based in Oakland, California, who for over a decade has been advocating a modernized environmentalism for the 21st century. And what that has increasingly meant for us is advocacy and innovation in nuclear energy. Today, uh, to the Thorium Energy Alliance, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think that nuclear energy is an environmentally friendly technology. And it won't be a surprise to any of you, obviously, that nuclear is low emissions um, and obviously has a lot of benefits for climate change. But there are a couple other reasons why we think nuclear energy fits into a modern, ver a modern vision of, uh, of environmentalism that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, so uh, again, Breakthrough has been advocating for a more technology-focused environmentalism for over a decade. Uh, my bosses, Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus, founded Breakthrough in the early 2000s after publishing an essay called The Death of Environmentalism. And since then, we have been big and often the leading advocates for US federal government investment in energy technology innovation. It actually started uh, with something called the Apollo Alliance and the Blue-Green Alliance in the early 2000s, which were really advocacy efforts led by Michael and Ted and, and many of their colleagues advocacy for investment in renewables and efficiency, and it, the, our look into nuclear actually came later. So for us, it was really a question that we had to address after Fukushima, why nuclear? And obviously everybody in this room has asked and answered that question, so I'll briefly go through some of the reasons. The first is actually cost, and what we hear about nuclear in the mainstream is that it's very expensive, you can't build a plant. But it turns out that we, we all know that nuclear isn't as expensive as the rap against it would suggest. So I and one of my colleagues did an analysis a few years ago that is represented here, which compared the Okiluoto plant in Finland, one of the most expensive nuclear power plants in the world being built today, comparing that to all the solar panels deployed in Germany over 2000 to 2011. And it turns out that even one of the most expensive nuclear power plants it will produce energy four times cheaper than Germans uh, than the Germans solar program over a 20 year basis. And we can come up with lots of different examples of this, um, of, of how even, even as we're talking about next generation nuclear, which Breakthrough fully supports, nuclear energy actually produces electricity very cheaply today, and that's worth remembering. Another reason is safety. Again, the rap against nuclear is that it's not safe, and I'm, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here when, when I absolutely reject that hypothesis. We know that despite all the fear mongering, nuclear power is one of the safest energy technologies available, and we know as some of the speakers have said here today, that nuclear does a much better job of managing, maintaining, and disposing of its waste products than most industries and most energy industries. And of course, there's the matter of emissions. Um, I think it's somewhat silly to compare the emissions of solar, wind, nuclear, uh, because compared to things like coal, oil, and gas, it's an order of magnitude difference. But if you were to do a life cycle analysis, you would find that nuclear power plants today produce carbon dioxide a little bit more than wind and a little bit, more, a little bit less than solar. Of course, that is before taking into account the backup power on the grid. These are all really familiar arguments. Cost, safety, low emissions, they're all reasons why I think most of us in this room support nuclear power. But I'm pleased by what I've heard at this conference so far about the, uh, hearing the words energy density and why, and why that matters so much for, for nuclear power. So this spring, for those who don't know, the Breakthrough Institute and, and uh, well, uh, several scholars from the Breakthrough Institute and some of our colleagues published what we call an eco-modernist manifesto, and that's available at ecomodernism.org. The basic idea behind an eco-modernist manifesto is to agree with one principle of environmentalism. We want to protect non-human natures. And is to disagree with another principle of environmentalism, which is that we want to harmonize with nature. Eco-modernism eco rejects the idea that we want to harmonize with, uh, with ecosystems, with non-human natures. What we are 
positing, what we believe is that the way that we save nature is by removing the human footprint from nature, is by decoupling the, the, the human economy from nature, not by harmonizing with it. So I can give a couple of examples of why that, that's true and why something like nuclear energy allows us to continue this process of decoupling and land sparing. It's, it's not actually unique to nuclear energy, the phenomenon through which modernization and technological innovation saves nature. This is a graph of the transition from wood to coal in the United States in the late 19th century. So fundamentally, fossil energy substitutes for wood and biomass for in, in the production of heat, eventually in the production of electricity and, and other energy services. So the transition from wood to coal actually saves forests. We hear a lot about deforestation, but forests in the United States have been growing back since the early 20th century. And as we've moved, moved, from, as we've moved from wood to coal and as agricultural yields have, have increased. Today, forested land in Great Britain is actually three times higher than it was in 1870. Uh, so if, if you're talking about aggregate impact on the landscape, if you're talking about saving forests and saving ecosystems, then intensifying your energy, your agricultural system, turns out to be not antithetical, but actually entirely, uh, entirely in line with, uh, with the goal of saving nature. Uh, we, we do see similar things in agriculture. As we've moved from subsistence organic agriculture to energy intensive industrial agriculture using tractors and fossil fuel based fertilizers, we've actually nearly doubled the global cropland productivity per capita just since the mid 20th century. One of our colleagues, Jesse Osubel at Rockefeller University, estimates that even with population and economic growth expected for the decades to come in the 21st century, uh, right around now we've reached peak global land footprint from uh, from agriculture, and that's largely due to uh, not not due to going more organic or more local, but actually going to more industrial and higher yield and more and more synthetic and uh, and fossil fuel based fer uh, fertilizer production to increase the the yield of an acre of agriculture. So what, what this process we see is that we are substituting energy services for ecosystem services. Instead of relying on the organic economy, we're relying more on the, on the fossil economy and on the synthetic economy. Obviously, we want, for, for, for many reasons, including energy density, we want to transition away from fossil energy, but fossil energy actually sort of shows us the map of how we lower our, our human footprint on the environment by increasing our energy consumption. So, uh, so while agreeing with much of what Dan from the California Native Plant Society said, I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit with his conclusion that we need to use less energy as a planet. First of all, one and a half billion of us don't have access to electricity at all. And if all humans today were to consume like Europeans do, we would need to triple global energy consumption just so that we're all using the same relatively efficient amount of energy as our, as our fellow modern humans. Secondly, there, there are these, these trends of technological substitution that do save nature, where you move from wood to coal, or you move from coal and oil to nuclear, and in some cases to, uh, to abundant renewable technologies. Coal, gas, and kerosene is what saved the whales in the 19th century. Desalination and wastewater technology can save our rivers and aquifers. The story of modernization is really fundamentally, in our view, a story of energy substituting for nature. And nuclear power, which is why we're so interested in nuclear power, is so promising because it has the potential to be the densest and most abundant of the energy technologies available. That's especially the case with advanced reactors and fuel cycles, which was why we're very pleased to talk to the Thorium Energy Alliance. That's, that's our philosophy, that, that's our worldview. I'm going to spend the rest of my few minutes talking about what Breakthrough is doing to advocate for nuclear power. Uh, in 2013, we released a report that some of you may, may have seen called How to Make Nuclear Cheap, which we pre presented to members of Congress, to the Department of Energy, to the White House, which, which is a technical report going over the many different advanced react reactor designs and talking about, okay, where are the choke points that we would want to target to bring down the cost of nuclear energy, to bring down the cost of building a plant? Where are the, the regulatory and licensing reform 
reforms that we can take so we can actually build test reactors, so we can have nuclear test beds, so we can have an advanced reactor industry in the United States. Uh, obviously, Breakthrough has also uh, been active in uh, media. It's a big part of our strategy is engaging with mainstream media. And for nuclear, that's meant everybody from CNN and USA Today to the New York Times to environmental magazines. Uh, and of, of course, we're all excited when my boss, Michael Schellenberger, who was featured in Robert Stone's film, Pandora Promise, Michael got to debate Ralph Nader on CNN a few years ago. That was very exciting. Look it up on YouTube. That was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Michael also was on the Colbert Report, which is one of my favorite media appearances that Breakthrough has been blessed with. So the, the good news is, while I'm a, obviously a, uh, an emissary from Breakthrough and a big fan of Breakthrough, we're not the only ones out there. There are other independent environmental and, uh, and, and technological organizations working to advance nuclear energy. Uh, this is a map from Third Way Clean Energy Program. Third Way is a centrist political think tank in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, according to new research from Third Way, there are on the, on the order of about 40 companies in advanced nuclear energy today. So something, so something on the so 40 on the something of the category of nuclear startups uh, that are capitalized at about 1.3 billion dollars today, according to Third Way. So there's actually you know a, a lot of, of of corporate and startup interest in advanced nuclear and and a fair amount of money. Obviously, we want more and we want a, a better partner in the federal government. But there's there's a lot of energy and activity in advanced nuclear, and we're pleased to see that. Uh, another big proponent of advanced nuclear is the. Clean Air Task Force, which historically has done most of the work on the regulatory side, uh, working with uh, Clean Air Act and working with the federal government to, uh, to clean up fossil energy. But the, the innovation program at Clean Air Task Force turns out to be, I think, one of the, actually one of the most exciting initiatives today advancing innovation globally, largely due to their, the Clean Air Task Force Asia project, which is the second bullet here. So Clean Air Task Force has an office in Boston and an office in Beijing. Those are their two offices. And their view, which we are increasingly sharing, is that China and India and parts of and the BRICS countries, parts of the Middle East, and increasingly in Africa, this is where energy consumption is growing fastest and innovation tends to happen where demand is growing fastest. So the question for us is not, are we going to give away the game of, of nuclear innovation to China and India? The question is, how can the world's most advanced energy innovation system, the United States, partner with this huge potential of growing electricity demand in places like China, and Clean Air Task Force is at the forefront uh, of working in that space. A very exciting new organization is Energy for Humanity. Uh, we have represented representatives of E4H here today, Robert Stone, everybody's favorite documentarian, Urs Bolt from Switzerland. Director uh, Kirsty Gogan is based in London, uh, and uh, as you can see from the bullets, Energy for Humanity is, a, is an independent advocacy organization dedicated to building grassroots engagement, working with uh, decision makers and policy makers, and to advance the goal of a safer, rapidly scalable, and pro proliferation resistant nuclear, nuclear energy regime. So the, the good news is that there, there is, I think, a growing movement in favor of nuclear energy and in favor of nuclear energy innovation. Uh, Breakthrough is happy to be a part of it, and we are very happy to now, uh, for the last few months, be able to talk about this vision of eco-modernism, uh, of energy and nuclear energy in particular being able to deliver cheap, scalable, heavily abundant energy so that we, so that we can lower the human footprint on the environment so that we can lessen our impact on ecosystems and so that we can continue this process of modernization that we all in the West, in the West world enjoy so much. So uh, those are my brief comments. Thank you so much for listening to me. Everything that I've said is available at thebreakthrough.org and ecomodernism.org and I will be around afterwards to uh, talk and chat. Thank you so much. Yes, I have a question uh, in regards to political advocacy, advocacy. California seems to be the toughest nut to crack in the country. Um, is there any help we can look through you to coordinate with us in, in changing that policy? Uh, well, I'll, I'll be uh, very upfront in saying that hopefully the answer to that question in the, in the coming years is yes. Breakthrough has historically focused on federal and international energy policy, so we don't actually do a whole lot of work at the California level, uh, but hopefully that's starting to change. I, I, I do see a, a lot of the energy in advanced nuclear really starting to pop up in places like Silicon Valley and the Bay Area and San Diego. 
um, and many of our senior fellows are, and, and our allies are interested in, in California advocacy for trying to change some of the, the laws uh, around nuclear deployment in California and try to push back on, for instance, the anti-Diablo Canyon uh, campaigns and things like that. Um, so we are part of that conversation, but it's not uh, part of our work directly right now. What, what is your experience and your judgment suggested that is the best approach to turn around the thinking of the major environmental groups who uh, persist in being uh, blind about uh, MSRs and the uh, mm -hmm. fourth generation nuclear? So at this point, I am not optimistic about that. We, Breakthrough has been really working on nuclear advocacy very intensely, since, only since Fukushima, but still for several years. And the big environmental organizations, we're talking Sierra Club, NRDC, Environmental Defense Fund, 350.org, still remain reflexively opposed to nuclear. And my take on that is that the boards of directors of these programs just refuse to have an open mind about it. That you can talk to some of the staff and some of the younger staff, and I have to take some pride in my generation that I think we're much more open-minded than the generations that came before me about nuclear energy. And so, I, so in the long run, I, I see an opening for for environmentalists to support nuclear energy, but I think it will be mostly through this paradigm-shifting work that we and Robert are attempting in telling these new stories and creating these new visions of an eco-modernist, not a 20th century environmentalist. <coughs> Um, and so, so short run, I, 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 I don't think that they're going to help. I don't think that they could help if they wanted to. Uh, I think we have to look at ourselves and to, and to other avenues to, to continue to support and advocate nuclear innovation.